Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the UFC London card for this coming Saturday. First of all, uh, for those of you that didn't know, it is a, an early fight card, Eastern time, uh, noon. Uh, I love those. That means you don't have to stay up till 3 o'clock in the morning Eastern to, to watch them, and you don't have to eschew your Saturday night plans to watch them. You could watch some of these fights during the day, which I like. Um. The other thing is that despite it being a 15-fight card, even though it's Thursday, there are a couple of fights that might get dropped due to weight issues, and we'll talk about that when we get there, but it's not that big of a deal, except that a 15-fight card from a DFS perspective is just kind of a different animal than your normal 12, 13-fight cards. Um, when, when you're dealing with a 15-fight card, you really you just can't get away with getting six of six winners. I mean, you you actually have to prioritize even the underdogs to those underdogs that are going to score well in wins. Um, and what makes this particular card uh, particularly interesting is that even though there are 15 fights, there are not that many fights that you would normally consider just kind of like locks from a fantasy perspective to uh, to be targeted. Um, we, we've had fights over the last couple of weeks where even though it was an 11 or 12 fight card that you just knew that the winner of that fight was going to be optimal and you could just kind of start by by stacking that fight. Like there was the, the peak fight from a few weeks ago. There was the um, uh, last week, the Azatar uh, fight. And you just kind of knew based on the metrics that whoever won that fight was just going to end up in the optimal lineup. Um, where... This fight card, even though there are 15 fights, it's not quite that easy. So what that means is a couple of things. Number one, um, I wouldn't be too concerned about ownership because I really doubt that that you're going to get concentrated ownership much of anywhere, with the exception of probably the main event. Um, I, I think that the that the main event favorite Tom Aspinall is going to end up being extremely popular. Even though he's 9,700, which is uh, you know obviously very very expensive, his metrics are so strong based uh, compared to the rest of the of the fighters that people are just going to play him. Uh, not to mention the fact that there are plenty of underdogs which people are making pretty reasonable cases for, which is going to allow people to play Aspinall almost with impunity. Uh, I don't want to say impunity. I mean you have to play these underdogs and get lucky with them, but but people have the confidence in a lot of these underdogs to play. And as a result, I think you're going to get a 50 to 60% owned um, Tom Aspinall. So you have the situation where the only real fighter that you have a lot of, not say a lot of confidence in that from a, from a statistical perspective, from a metrics perspective is sort of a lock. Um, he's going to be really, really popular. Um, so what this becomes is a, is, is a, is an MME, uh, MME centric card. In other words, if you're the type to play 150 lineups, this this card is for you because there are a lot of combinations that could become optimal, and there are a lot of combinations that, as a result, can take it down by uh, take this big MME lottery tournament down solo. So, if you are the type that might consider playing 150, this would be the card to do it. So what we're going to do is we are going to go through fight by fight and hopefully it doesn't take too long because one thing that I will notice, and this is again, kind of an interesting push and pull on the one hand, as we go through these fights, like individually, none of them are going to seem that great from a DFS perspective. They'll seem okay, but not great. But yet, you know, that, that in 15 fights, you're just going to get a handful of them that just go off. You know, just because of the way the you know, math works. Um, I don't know exactly which ones they're going to be, um, but you just know you're going to get them. Um, so let's let's get into this, um, and then uh, we'll try to make heads or tails of this somehow. So the first fight of the night, we have uh, Theo, uh, Filho versus Daniel Barres. Um, you have a couple of things going on here. Uh, Filho 
is is coming off of a of a fight against Makayev where he was a huge underdog, and he gave Makayev backers an enormous scare by almost submitting him uh, to the point where Makayev actually just decided he'd rather just have his leg broke than submit. And he ended up, I think, getting his leg snapped and yet still fighting back and getting the submission himself, which is uh, actually quite amazing. In addition to that, you have Daniel Barrez, who has really been just kind of coming into his own. I mean, he he is he's got a whole bunch of wins, and then he had a split decision win against a split decision loss against Carlos Hernandez. Um, so you have a pretty good matchup, you know, right off the bat here. And from a, I don't want to say a narrative perspective, I guess from a narrative perspective, what you have going on with Philo is 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 something that happens quite a bit. You have somebody that's coming off of a loss, which people kind of respected. Like, wow, they, he lost, but, you know, much respect. And usually guys like that end up being kind of over-owned or over-projected or over-something. Um, we'll leave that for the uh, for the betting breakdown. But nonetheless, I mean, you do have two fighters who are closely aligned as far as price. Um, and you do have both fighters with kind of a, a decent path to victory. You have Barros is more of a striker, although he does have some wrestling. And you have Philo, who you, everybody saw, um, does have submission skills. So we should just go to the right to the to the metrics and see what these inside the distance lines look like. You have uh, Philo inside the distance would be plus 250. And then you have Barra's inside the distance is plus about 300. Now, again, I'm kind of splitting the difference with respect to the VIG. So Philo definitely has a better chance based on, you know, Vegas uh, to finish. So you'd have to think that he's probably the better play. Um, he is a little bit more expensive at 8,300. Um, but even still, I still that make I think it makes Fieldho just a little bit better. Now, however, that doesn't mean that either of these guys are guys you have to play. I mean, you're talking about an $8,300 fighter with an inside the distance line of like plus 250, which is which is not terrible, but it's not like some of these ones we've been getting. We had like that McKinney fight where both fighters were like plus 160 inside the distance at like 8,200. Um, and it's, you know, it's just the metrics are just not that great given these prices. As a result, though, I don't think either of them are going to be particularly popular either. So you could sort of make a case for both of these guys. I would just say that based on the metrics, you just have to give Philo the advantage um, just because he just has a little bit better inside the distance line. Um, and it's not even just because of the takedown upside, because I don't even know if Philo has takedown upside per se. You can even argue that Barres might actually have more takedown upside. So it is kind of a close fight with respect to DFS. I think that I would play some Philo. If I get to some Barres, just, you know, when I run my, my optimals and stuff, yes, that's fine. But this is one of several fights which are just kind of okay, but not incredible priorities. Uh, moving on, you have uh, Shauna Barron versus uh, Bruno Brazil. And so you have a couple of things going on with the Brazil side. So Brazil, she um, she was a decent-sized favorite over Denise Gomes in her, in her last fight. She got roasted. Um, so one thing that she has going against her, I guess for her, would be recency bias. I imagine that a lot of people are down on her after that performance. But then what happened is Denise Gomes kind of validated that win with a big knockout over, over Yasmin Uruguay last week. So the MMA math will now trump the recency bias. So that kind of cancels out. So all you're left with is probably a, a regular matchup between two fighters where you just have to look at the at the styles and the and the various metrics. Um, so we get into it and we have neither fighter with a particularly strong inside the distance line. You have Brazil inside the distance is plus 300 again. Bannon inside the distance is like plus a million, you know. Um, but I am seeing a little bit of love for the Bannon side. Uh, people are making the case that that she's going to wrestle, maybe. 
Uh, I'll say this. I mean, she's definitely active, but from what I've seen, she isn't that much of a wrestler. As a matter of fact, her main um, background was was pure kickboxing. She was a five-time kickboxing champ back when she was an amateur. So I don't think she's going to be going for that many takedowns, really. Um, I just think this is going to be just a kickboxing match between two ladies with very poor inside the distance lines. And I think it's just probably a fade. Um, if if you get there again in 150 max, yeah, that's fine. Just because they're both going to be, I imagine, really low owned. But I really don't have an opinion on one or the other. And the whole fight is probably just a pass. All right. So now you have Chris Duncan versus Yanal Ashmus. Um, and... We have Duncan as a 150 favorite. Ajmus is plus 125. Let's take a look at the DraftKings pricing here. So there's no real edge here. Duncan's 8,400 versus 7,800. So it's not like you're getting any line value here. Let's just take a look first at the inside the distance lines. And, and surprisingly, you're going to see Ashmood. And again, it's like a plus 300. The reason why it's surprising is people just saw him knock somebody out in about you know a minute and a half in his last fight. So for and so for someone who really there's a whole the, a lot of the community is playing both in in regular in betting and in DFS, it's really just not supported by the metrics. Um, so if he ends up being that kind of popular fighter, that popular underdog that people will play, and you could just see it, you know, because he just smashed as an underdog in his last fight. And people just love people just love playing stuff like this. So if, if people are looking for good underdogs with big upside, like I mentioned in, in the lead-in, and you see this guy at 7,800 who just smashed, people might play him, but again, his metrics are really not that great. What I might consider is the other side of this is almost leverage against him because let's go look at this. So Chris Duncan... His inside the distance prop is is not is is first of all much better. It's plus one sixty, but not only that, but he also has wrestling upside. In his last fight, even though he didn't get the finish, he showed that he could wrestle. So if he could put those two things together, if he could wrestle and threaten to finish, I mean, this is a, you know, I think he's got a lot of ways to score here. So I actually prefer the Duncan side um, in GPPs as potential leverage against what I think could be a, a pretty chalky Ashmus uh, underdog play. Um, I, I encourage everybody to watch, you know, for ownership projections, which will come out maybe tomorrow. Um, see if I'm wrong about that, but it just seems so logical to, for you to play Ashmus coming off that a minute and a half knockout. And I'm going to talk about him when we do the betting breakdown tomorrow. Um, as far as whether he's a good bet tomorrow, but from a DFS perspective, I just have this feeling that he's um that he's the guy you're supposed to get leverage against. Uh, that's just my opinion. Uh, Ashmus again. If I, listen, if I get to him, I'll probably end up demanding that I get low on guys alongside of him because I do think he's going to be one of the more popular underdogs. All right, uh, moving up the card, you have Caitlin Vieira against Penny Kansad and. On a 15-fight card, it's going to be difficult for this fight to garner a lot of DFS attention. I mean, if you look at the inside the distance line, you have the onside inside the distance, like plus 1,000. Vieira inside this is a little bit better, plus 350. But but for that price, plus 350 for a $9,100 fighter is pretty brutal. So this fight is just going to be a, a stone-cold pass. Um, all right, moving on up the card, you have Mahmoud Muradov versus Brian Barbarena. All right, so this is the first of the 9K and up fighters, which you need to get an inside the distance prop of at least minus 110 if you're over 9K. And if you're 9,500, you need a little bit better than that. I mean, you, you need to have either big first round KO, like almost like minus i say minus, maybe not minus 110 to finish in the first round, but pretty close. Or a combination of a minus 110 inside the distance prop with a lot of wrestling upside. I think Muradov just falls just a little bit 
a little bit short. Uh, just a little bit short. Uh, however, when we compare him to other 9K fighters, maybe he'll end up being someone we play. Remember, we talked about um, Aspinall at 9,700 being probably the most popular fighter on the slate. So if you could play Maradab instead of Aspinall somehow and get away with it, you're definitely going to get some leverage there. Um, but as far as the pure metrics go, I'm mean, going to just take a look at it. Muradab inside the distance is, um, I don't know, that's not bad, minus 150. When you account for big, that's actually not bad at all. Let's look at Merid Muradab in round one, plus, ugh, plus 300. Uh, is he going to wrestle? I mean, it's possible. I mean, Barbarina really doesn't have any takedown defense, so it's possible. It just seems so hard to believe that on a 15 fight card, a score of like 100 is going to get there at 9,500 into the optimal, which is really what Muradov is going to. I don't want to say his ceiling is 100. Because look, if he gets a first round KO, especially in the first minute, you know, then that's, that's certainly more than 100. But Barbarina is tough, man. He, I don't, I don't see him getting knocked out in the first round. And, and if Muradov gets there in the second round, that's just not going to be enough. So, I think that in a vacuum, it's probably a poor play, but as leverage, it's probably okay. A Barbarina is just his win odds are just not quite as you know good enough for me to get to him, um, so he's not going to be in my pool, I imagine. All right, Michael Parkin or Mick Parkin versus Jamal Pogues. Uh, heavyweight fight, you have Pogues at minus 150 or so, minus 140 with Vig. Let's take a look at the um pricing yeah pose at 8900 uh at 8900 i think that's probably a little bit of line value in, in parking no i mean at plus only 140 to be getting um 7300 that's extremely strong um He's he's a, a fighter from Great Britain who trains under Tom Aspinall. Not trains under Tom Aspinall. Tra trains with Tom Aspinall, and and this guy's been getting a lot of hype. Um, he he's coming off of I think that I don't think I think the contender series. He fought just just some terrible, terrible opponents, and then in his last fight he came in as a a plus uh, one fifty underdog, and he. Knocked the guy and he submitted the guy in the first round. Um, so what do you make of a guy like this? I mean, it's it, it looks like the the British community knows what they're doing by putting him in this fight, and and the money line has been slowly but surely just just going Parkins' way. So you're getting number one money line value on Parkin, and then when you look at the Inside the distance line, I have to think for a heavyweight fight, I mean, it, it's got to be good enough, right? Let's take a look. I mean, Parkin, we'll look at Pogues in a second, but I mean, Parkin inside the distance plus 220 or so at 7,100, 70, I mean, plus the line value. I mean, that looks like an extremely strong underdog. And this is the, herein lies the 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 beauty actually of DFS. So I just made an incredible case. I would I would think for why Parkin's a good underdog here. He has line value, he has finish equity, and all of that. So the thing is, if I know that, then you have to believe that he's going to also be one of the more popular underdogs. So you really have to think of the possibility of playing the other side of this. And that's just the way DFS MMA works. It's the way DFS tennis works because you have guys literally going right against one another. Um, it's the most pure way to get leverage over popular plays is to play guys that will di directly benefit from the other one's failure. So uh, let's take a look at Pogues. He's going to have bad line value for the exact reason why Pogues has good line value, right? He's 8,900 and he's only minus 160 to win. That's terrible. 
inside the distance you have Pogues is exactly the same as Parkin. Um, so his inside the distance line is kind of poor. He does have some takedown upside from his last fight. So this is going to be one of those where, where from a pure metrics perspective, I can't really get to him. But from a leverage perspective, I really think you should consider it, you know? Um, so I think that in a weird way, this could be a key fight. You know, I think Parkin is obvious, obviously, I think Parkin is an, an elite play when you consider all the fundamentals of DFS analysis. And for that exact reason, Pogues is a good play on the other side. Um, so Parkin and Pogues for a just kind of gross heavyweight fight just might be one of the key fights. Now, this is all going to depend, uh, again, on, on how right I am about Parkin being high owned. So we're just going to have to continue to watch the ownership projections as we get near uh, closer to lock. But if he's going to end up being, say, 30% or even 25% owned, um, Pose could be kind of a sneaky little uh, sneaky leverage player. All right. Um, Mark Casey versus Joel Alvarez. So you have Alvarez about a minus 200. Well, plus Vegas, like minus 180. You're expecting him to be at about 9K. Is that about right? Let's take a look. Uh, yeah, right about there. Exactly there. And we have to look at the wind conditions here. Let, let, let's first take a look at uh, Joel Alvar Alvarez. Uh, is inside the distance line at 9K, you really want it at minus 110? And you're getting it. You know, Alvarez minus 125 or with plus Vigs minus 110, it's pretty much exactly what you want. The only issue is that his inside the distance line is predicated on his win condition, which is probably by submission. And the thing about fighters that win by submission is that they come into uh, two categories. One is the fighter that takes the opponent down and gets the submission. And the other is the person who accepts being taken down and gets the submission. The, the former is much more fantasy friendly because he gets the, the takedowns and control time to go with the submissions. And the latter is not as fantasy friendly because he gets a submission, but that's it. You know, um, so Alvarez, even though his inside the distance line is strong, even his inside the distance wins might not even score that well. So I, I so I think that he is not really the greatest play here. Um the problem is we haven't really found anybody better yet, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. The other side of this Dia Casey. So I, I have this weird sense that he is going to be a, a, a sort of a popular underdog. And the reason why is because it's almost nickname driven. So he had not wrestled much until a few fights ago where he fought uh, a Borshev and then he also fought somebody else. And he ended up getting like 20 takedowns in two fights. So they called him like D1D Casey. And then people were shocked when in his last fight, he didn't get any takedowns against Michael Johnson. So what you're getting in this fight is the idea that D Casey, although he only wins the fight about 40, you know, 35% of the time, that his win condition is predicated on him getting takedown, which is, you know, very fantasy friendly. And uh, yeah, I mean, that certainly makes sense. I mean, you look at his inside the distance line, it's, it's really poor, it's plus 500. Um, and while that does make sense, here's the problem. The problem is, is that I'm not 100% convinced that he goes for the takedowns in the first place. And also what that means is I'm also not convinced that all of his win conditions are based on him getting takedowns. I mean, I, I think that, Dia Casey, he went through all those takedowns against against two of the worst wrestlers in the division. So even though he doesn't have the reputation of having the sharpest fight IQ, you could say that those were two just calculated decisions to go with his his strongest win condition against those opponents. Um, and in this particular matchup, from what I've heard. 
going for the takedowns might not even be his path, path, best path to victory because you're playing into Alvarez's very strong submission game. From what I'm gathering, Dia Casey is probably just as good of a striker as um, as Alvarez, if not better. So it's possible that Dia Casey just tries to keep this on the feet and win a very boring striking-based decision. So the point is, is that number one, well, the point is, is that even if he does win, I don't think it's necessarily so that he's in optimal. Because I don't think that it's necessarily so that he gets those takedowns. So I don't think that Dia Casey is going to be that popular. Um, but he might be. So again, we're going to watch these these ownership projections. And Alvarez, again, even though in and of itself he's just kind of an okay play, if we do get the sense that Dia Casey is going to be popular, then you could play a little bit more of, of, of Alvarez. Again, because the more 9K and up guys you play instead of, um, what's his name, instead of Aspinall, the more leverage you're going to have over Aspinall if, if you decide to you know play GPPs where you fade him, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, so uh, that's my opinion on this fight. Moving on, we have Johnny Parsons versus Danny Roberts. And this is uh, one of the, is it 8K, 8K? It's pretty close, right? Yeah, it's actually 8,000 for Roberts and 8,200 for Parsons. You have a essentially a striker versus striker matchup. Uh, Roberts is more of a boxer. Parsons is more of a Muay, uh, a Muay Thai fighter. We just have to just take a look at the internals here and see what we have. I mean, I've heard all the stories about Roberts having a bad chin, and yet, yet uh, Parsons really hasn't fought anybody. Um, let's just let's just let's just let the numbers kind of drive us to the decisions here. So even though it's a it's a it's a well priced fight, in other words, you you want to get this in if you can. You still need some type of upside. And if you look at the various inside the distance line, like Roberts inside the distance plus 300 and plus 300 is just not going to be good enough at 8,000 or 8,200. So I'm not going to do that. But Parsons at plus 170, I mean, that's really where all the upside is. So for me, it's really Parsons in this fight. Um, and I think I already see where we're headed here. I mean, I think that if you have if you have the cojones to do it, I think you can get away with 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 fading with with playing lineups without Aspinall if you want to do that because you're getting these mid range guys like and, and these these sort of these underdogs like you play Duncan, Parkin, Parsons, guys like that, you know, even even somebody in the Filio fight, um, you might not even have to play these nine K guys. Remember, we already said that Muradov is is a good play, but I don't know. Is he going to really pay off ninety five hundred? And we'll get to Aspinall in a minute. Um, and we already said that Alvarez is, you know, good, but not great. So you, maybe you can build one of these middling lineups if you play guys like Parsons. The other thing that Parsons will do for you, by the way, is obviously it'll let you get up to the 9K guys as well if you do want to do that. All right. Um, so, again, Parsons for me uh, and no uh, – and I don't think I'm going to play any Danny Roberts. Um, all right. Davey Grant against Daniel Marcos. Well, you have 150 and plus uh, 110 on the other side. So we're expecting to see about 8,600 or so, maybe 8,600 versus 7,600, something like that. And that's what you're getting pretty much, 85, 77. So again, there's no, there, neither fighter really has that much wrestling upside. So we just have to just go again with the internals and see what we get here. And you have... Uh, Grant inside the distance plus 320. Not really that great. I mean, really not great at all. Marcos inside this plus 300. That's even worse. You know, so I don't know. I think this fight's probably, listen, according to the numbers, this fight's just going to be a pass. I mean, I've heard a lot of analysis of this fight, and, you know, people want to play Davy Grant, all action and whatever, but the numbers don't really seem to support it. So uh, I'm probably going to end up. Uh, uh, fading this fight or being underweight on it, uh, certainly in my bigger buy-ins. Um, speaking of which, you have Lerone Murphy versus Josh Koulibau. Um, Murphy is coming off of his controversial decision win over Gabriel Santos. 
And Kulabau is coming off a rather opportunistic win over uh, Magnusarian. And uh, it's basically two strikers here. And, and you have two strikers that usually uh, does not make for high fantasy scores unless, uh, you know, we have a strong inside the distance line for either or both fighters. And you look at it and you don't have it. I mean, the fight goes to decision itself is like minus 160. You have Murphy inside the distance plus 350, Kulabau plus 350. This is just seems like a strikers based fight where the winner is going to win a decision. And so you probably want to want to fade that. Um, I don't see a lot of line value either. So listen, it's, it's like when my when my kids were applying to college, they like to say that you know if you're looking at a big school versus a small school, you want to try to make the big school seem small, and you want to make try to make the small school seem big, and that's what you want to try to do with these fifteen card slates if you can, is to make them a little bit smaller. Um, so fading fights like the Kulabau fight, fading fights like the Marcos fight, which people are going to play, will allow you to get more combinations, like from the key fights there. Uh, oh, oops. Uh, I don't know what's going on over there. I have to, I just want to pull the DraftKings board up a little bit. Oh, it's not going to let me log in probably because I'm on Zoom. Is that what's, that, that what's happening to me? Let's see. Let's see. Uh, let's look at this. Okay. All right. Uh, moving on up the card, we have Ja Herbert versus Ferris Zion. And um, uh, listen, the tide has turned, right? So Ferris Zion in his last fight was a big underdog against... Um, Michael Figlock, and he basically owned him for like the whole fight, uh, coming off of the big uh, KO loss or submission loss to Terrence McKinney. And then he's got fights against Ben Trebini and, and Malarkey, and, and it's it's really funny the way the way um, recency bias works. Now, all of a sudden, you have Zayam after he fought a guy that no one's heard of, you know, just because he was super hyped. Now all of a sudden he's like the nuts, and everybody's saying that he's now he's, he's made improvements, and now everybody's playing him. I guess the good thing is is that we're not we don't have to get sucked into the recency bias here because I don't even think that he's going to rate well. Let's take a look. Um, oh wait, that's the Craig fight. So Z Ziam inside the distance, he is like plus two forty. He's plus 240 inside the distance at 8,700, which is really not that great. I mean, he does have some wrestling, I suppose. Um, in his last fight, he showed some, but he seems to be more of, a, of, a, of an at-range striker. It just feels like this is a fight, again, which is just going to stay at range and just really nothing is going to happen. Um, and on the other side of this, I don't think that Herbert is any great shakes either. Um, doesn't have a lot of wrestling upside, if any. Hit him inside this is plus 500. So it's another fight, which is probably uh, probably pretty close to a fade, if you want to know the truth. Okay, uh, 14, uh, actually 11 fights down, four to go. Paul Craig versus Andre Muniz. All right, so this is, this is when you sort of have to play. So you have, well, we'll, we'll get to that. Muniz minus 200, Craig plus 170. And the line value is, is very, uh, I guess, pretty standard, like Muniz 9,300. I guess Muniz might be a little bit uh, overpriced relative to his win odds, but not much. Let's take a look at the inside the distance lines. You have two, uh, two grapplers here, and we'll take a look at Muniz's inside the distance prop first. Again, for 9,300, you want takedowns plus a minus 110. And you're getting minus 120 or minus 115 or so, which is good. Uh, and that's 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 very strong. Um, we're going to get to the style thing in a second. Paul Craig on the other side, plus 360 inside the distance. It's really just not great. I mean, it's fine. I, I I really prefer to have inside the distance lines at plus 300 or better um, to play really anybody. 
uh, especially a submission or bust guy like this. I mean, he's not going to get takedowns or anything like that. So I'm probably going to be off of, of Craig. The only way I would reason I'd play Craig is if I thought Muniz is going to be really popular. And yet I don't think that any of these guys are going to be that popular. It's certainly not enough to just blindly warrant me playing the other side for leverage if I didn't like the other components of his, you know, of his metrics. Here, here's the problem with the Muniz side. For you to get there on Muniz, you know, you 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 need him. Do you need him to go for takedowns? That's a good question because you can really make the case that he tries to keep this on the feet. I mean, you can, because all Paul Craig does is get submissions. And what Andre Muniz showed in his last fight against Brandon Allen, even though he lost, was he does have some good striking. And that's where Paul Craig is really poor. So if I were, honestly, if I were Muniz's coach and I just wanted to get the win, I'd probably just keep this fight on the feet. I, I would. Uh, but again, these guys don't just want to win. They want to go for submissions. They want to go for, for, for performance bonuses and things like that. So, um, I do think the Muniz is probably going to go for it. The other thing that's good about the Muniz play is that even if he does just go for striking, he could still get like a first round knockout, you know? Um, it's not as if, if he doesn't go for takedowns, he's not going to, he's not going to get there. Um, so I think the Muniz does have multiple paths to paying off his price tag, which I guess means that he's probably my favorite of the 9K guys we've discussed. I guess that's my that's one way to say it. Now, again, it is very possible that that this whole fight busts if Muniz does what I think is smart <laughs> and just you know picks him apart, keeps him at range, and doesn't get into too much too much trouble. Um, and coming off a loss again, maybe that's the way what he's supposed to do. Just try to get that W and like move up. But uh, yeah, I do I do like the knee side, and because I don't think he's gonna be as popular as some of these others, I, I don't as, as say Aspinall, or whatever. I don't think that Craig is gonna be that po- uh, that great of a leverage play. So, uh, I know he's gonna be a popular underdog, people like playing him. And again, when, when all the guy does is win by submission, I can see it. Um, but uh, I, I just am not going to do it, I don't think. All right, uh, three fights left. Nathaniel Wood versus Andre Feely. So we have another 9K-plus guy. You have Nathaniel Wood is minus 200. You expect to get him again about 9,100 versus 7,100, and pretty well fairly priced. Um, But for Nathaniel Wood to get there, he's got to, once again, have a minus 110 in sudden distance prop or have significant takedown upside. And it's close because you, you look at his inside the distance line first, and it's really not great. It's plus 350. I mean, not great. It's horrible. I mean, there are guys that are 7,100 with better inside the distance lines. What you're getting from him is the possibility of takedown upside. The reason I mention that, okay, is that in his last fight, he got five takedowns. Fair enough. But in every other fight, he doesn't really have multiple takedowns. So it's it's not that clear that he's going to go for them. What he does have going for him is he also has a great amount of volume. So in all these last four fights here, he had 128 strikes, 102, 138, 136. So even if he doesn't get the finish, I guess, oh boy, I, I just don't think he could get there at 9,300 without a finish. I just don't think he could do it. So he's going to be one of the, one of the, one of the lesser nine K fighters. Um, can you play him for leverage? Sure. But aside from that, no. And because he's going to rate out poorly, that means that Feely on the other side is probably not a great play because he, he doesn't really carry with him quite a, you know, much leverage. So without much leverage, we're just looking at his internals, and and they're probably extremely poor. He's got to be plus three hundred for us probably to play him, and it's a plus four forty, and he doesn't really have any takedown upside. So, uh, again, probably a fight I'm going to pass or at least get underway. Um, all right, so we got the, the last two fights, which are two more nine game fighters, and you have Molly McCann versus Julius Stolarenko. Um, 
you have again minus 200 you're expected to see 9100 or so and that's what you're getting actually that's not true you're getting Molly McCann at 9400 you know at 9400 I mean you know what you need I mean you need at least minus 110 plus takedown upside and according to these numbers it's just an extremely poor play I mean you have McCann at Inside the distance, like plus 140 or so, which is atrocious for that price. And she doesn't take anybody down. And if she does take somebody down, that's probably her best path to a loss because all Stolyarenko likes to do is, is get arm bars. So um, the last thing McCann wants is to turn into a grappling fight. So she's probably just going to try to go for a KO or something like that. And she could get in the first round, but it's just very not very likely. Um, Stole your ink inside the distance is pretty is is obviously interesting because again all of her wins are by submission. So her inside the distance prop like plus three thirty or so it's not the best but it's not terrible. So I do think that she is probably alive as an underdog here. The only thing that makes her a little weak is there is kind of the absence of um of of that much leverage. Okay. Um, so you'll probably have to play her just because if she does get the submission at 6,800, I mean, it doesn't even matter what round it comes in. Um, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna want her. So, um, uh, I, I do think you have to play some of that. I don't think you have to play that much Molly McCann though, if you want to know the truth. And then, uh, in the main event, I mean, unfortunately or unfortunately, this is, I mean, Tom Aspinall is just a complete standout. Um, and it has nothing to do with this being a five round fight. Cause if it goes five rounds, he's busting. For openers, um, well, I shouldn't say he's busting, but it's very unlikely. Very unlikely he's go that he goes five rounds. I don't think he's ever been to a third round, right? Let's take a look. Tom Aspinall, I mean, one, one time he's never even been to the third round. I mean, I don't care if this is five rounds or not. Um, uh, all right, so here's the case I'll make. Actually, should I make this a betting breakdown? No, okay, here's the case. Well, let's make the case for him. I mean, he's minus 400 and he has an inside the distance prop of probably minus 400 um aspinel inside the distance is minus 350 or something i mean aspinel in round one is plus 105 i mean this is you know it's just an elite play it just is and that's why he's going to be 60 percent owned um you want to make the case against him all right First of all, let's make the case against him in the fight. Case against him in the fight is that, number one, he's never been more than two rounds. So if Tybura could survive the onslaught, maybe Aspinall doesn't have the cardio, which we just don't know. The other thing, he is coming off like, like multiple knee surgeries. He had, he had a torn MC, MCL and he had ACL damage. And uh, is he ready to come back? I honestly don't know the answer because... There's no way he was missing this card. I mean, he's from in London. This is where he got the injury last year. There's no way that he's not fighting today. You know, so it's possible that he wasn't even ready to come back yet. And yet he's doing it. I mean, I don't know the answer. I mean, listen, uh, fighters would be wise to not comment on their health. You want to know the truth? Um, because if, if Tybura, and this is what Tybura is probably going to do, if, if Tybora knows or suspects that Aspinall's knee is still hurt, you know what he's going to do? He's just going to go for like, if he's this, that's what I would do. And what that means is this, this fight could, it, it could bust. Okay. So like if Aspinall just can't get him out of the early and Tybora kind of keeps him at range, keeps him at bay with the kicks. Remember, like if you're Aspinall and you're just coming off your last fight where you just, you know, got your knee torn up. And it's your first fight back. I would be a little bit afraid of people kicking my knee or kicking my leg. So maybe Aspinall is a little bit cautious. I, I don't know. So that's the argument against it. Um, but it's uh listen, it's obviously a very, very, very strong play. And unfortunately, you are gonna have to play Tybora here, I think. Um just because it, it's 20 percent, he's probably gonna win the fight 20% of the time. But if you do, if you get away with it, you're beating all the Aspinall lineups. Okay. 
Uh, and not only are you beating all the Aspinall lineups, but if you think about it, you're also beating probably some of these parking lineups that might be popular. Some of these Dia Casey lineups might be popular because so you're probably going to have to play some Tybora, whether you like it or not. Um, who knows? Maybe the same thing happens. Maybe he gets a leg kick. Aspinall knee blows out again. I mean, obviously nobody wants that, but uh, that's my opinion. So to to uh, to recap, uh, we're going to go from the bottom up again. I think Bias Filio is a very reasonable fight, not a huge priority, but it's definitely something you want you want to consider. I think Brazil Bannon is probably a, a fade. Duncan Ashmus, very very strong fight. Uh, I think Duncan is pretty good leverage there. Vieira Penzi uh, Pen uh, fade. Uh, Muradov kind of tough to get to him uh, with his metrics. Pogue Parkin, very very strong fight to target. Uh, Alvarez D. Casey, um, probably an okay fight to target. Not not the greatest, but but uh, but okay. Uh, Parsons would be the side I would take on the uh, Parsons Robert uh, Roberts fight. David Grant Marcos probably underweight. Laron Murphy cool about probably underweight. Zion Herbert probably underweight. Craig Muniz very very uh, I think Muniz is probably one of the strongest, if not the strongest, nine K fighter. Feely Wood, probably just, a, you know, probably fade. McCann, shoot Stulyarenko. McCann's tough to get to. Uh, so Stulyarenko probably is pretty good at 6,800. And Aspinall is just kind of an elite play. So if you if you highlight these, the, the Filio is becoming a little bit better in my eyes. Duncan Ajmus, um, Pogues, Parkin, uh, maybe... Uh, the Parsons play, you could make this uh, very, very large card small, but in 150 max, you're probably going to have to play some amount of everybody <laughs> um, because we all know what's going to happen. That Penny Can said it's going to knock Vieira out in the first round at 2% ownership and break the stuff. That's just the way MMA works. Nonetheless, that will do it for my DFS breakdown. Stay tuned for my betting breakdown, which is a lot more fun, very contrarian. And we're going to have a lot of fun with this. Uh, we'll probably do that tomorrow. Good luck, everybody.